This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Colin Ward, Anarchism as a Theory of Organization. You may think, in describing anarchism as a theory of organization, I am propounding a deliberate paradox. Anarchy you may consider to be, by definition, the opposite of organization. In fact, however, anarchy means the absence of government, the absence of authority. Can there be a social organization without authority, without government? The anarchists claim that there can be, and they also claim that it is desirable that there should be. They claim that, at the basis of our social problems, is the principle of government. It is, after all, governments which prepare for war and wage war, even though you are obligated to fight in them and pay for them. The bonds you are worried about are not the bonds which cartoonists attribute to the anarchists, but the bonds which governments have perfected, at your expense. It is, after all, governments which make and enforce the laws which enable the haves to retain control over social assets, rather than share them with the have-nots. It is, after all, the principle of authority which ensures that people will work for someone else for the greater part of their lives, not because they enjoy it or have any control over their work, but because they see it as their only means of livelihood. It is said that I said that it is governments which make wars and prepare for wars, but obviously it is not governments alone. The power of a government, even the most absolute dictatorship, depends on a tacit assent of the governed. Why do people consent to be governed? It isn't only fear. What have millions of people to fear from a small group of politicians? It is because they subscribe to the same values as their governors. Rulers and ruled alike believe in the principle of authority, of hierarchy, of power. These are the characteristics of the political principle. The anarchists, who have always distinguished between the state and society, adhere to the social principle, which can be seen wherever men link themselves in an association based on a common need or a common interest. The state, said the German anarchist Gustav Landauer, it is not something which can be destroyed by a revolution, but it is a condition, a certain relationship between human beings, a mode of human behavior. We destroy it by contrasting other relationships, by behaving differently. Anyone can see that there are at least two kinds of organization. There is the kind which is forced on you, the kind which is run from above, and there is the kind which is run from below, which can't force you to do anything, and which you are free to join or free to leave alone. We could say that the anarchists are people who want to transform all kinds of human organization into the kind of purely voluntary association where people can pull out and start one of their own if they don't like it. I once, in reviewing that frivolous but useful little book, Parkinson's Law, attempted to enunciate four principles behind an anarchist theory of organization. That they should be one, voluntary, two, functional, three, temporary, and four, small. They should be voluntary for obvious reasons. There is no point in our advocating individual freedom and responsibility if we're going to advocate organizations for which membership is mandatory. They should be functional and temporary precisely because permanence is one of those factors which harden the arteries of an organization, giving it a vested interest in its own survival, and serving the interests of office holders rather than its function. They should be small precisely because in small face-to-face -face groups, their bureaucratizing and hierarchical tendencies inherent to organizations have least opportunity to develop. But it is from its final point that our difficulties arise. If we take it for granted that a small group can function anarchically, we are still faced with the problem of all the social functions for which organization is necessary, but which require it on a much bigger scale. Well, we might reply, as some anarchists have, if big organizations are necessary, count us out. We will get by as well as we can without them. We can say this all right, but if we are propagating anarchism as a social philosophy, we must take into account and not evade social facts. Better to say, let us find ways in which the large-scale functions can be broken down into functions capable of being organized by small functional groups, and then link these groups in a federal manner. The classical anarchist thinkers, envisaging the future organization of society, thought in terms of two kinds of social institution. As a territorial unit, the commune, a French word which you might consider as the equivalent of the word parish, 
or the Russian word Soviet in its original meaning, but which also has overtones of the ancient village institutions for cultivating the land in common, and a syndicate, another French word from trade union terminology, the syndicate or workers' council as a unit of industrial organization. Both were envisaged as small local units which would federate with each other for larger affairs of life, while retaining their own autonomy, the one federating territorially and the other industrially. The nearest thing in ordinary political experience to the federative principle propounded by Proudhon and Kropotkin would be the Swiss rather than the American federal system. And without wishing to sing a song of praise for the Swiss political system, we can see that the 22 independent cantons of Switzerland are a successful federation. It is a federation of like units, of small cells, and the cantonal boundaries cut across linguistic and ethnic boundaries so that, unlike the many unsuccessful federations, the confederation is not dominated by one or a few powerful units. For the problem of federation, as Leopold Kor puts it in The Breakdown of Nations, is one of division, not of union. Herbert Luthi writes of his country's political system, Every Sunday, the inhabitants of scores of communes go to the polling booths to elect their civil servants, ratify such and such an item of expenditure, or decide whether a road or a school should be built. After settling the business of the commune, they deal with cantonal elections and voting on cantonal issues. Lastly, come to decisions on federal issues. In some cantons, the sovereign people still meet in a Rousseau-like fashion to discuss questions of common interests. It may be thought that this ancient form of assembly is no more than a pious tradition with a certain value as a tourist attraction. If so, it is worth looking at the results of local democracy. The simplest example is the Swiss railway system, which is the densest network in the world. At great cost, and with great trouble, it has been made to serve the needs of the smallest localities and most remote valleys, not as a paying proposition, but because such was the will of the people. It is the outcome of fierce political struggles. In the 19th century, the democratic railway movement brought the small Swiss communities into conflict with the big towns, which had plans for centralization. And if we compare the Swiss system with the French, which, with admirable geometrical regularity, is entirely centered on Paris, so that the prosperity or the decline, the life or death of whole regions, has depended on the quality of the link with the capital, we see the difference between a centralized state and a federal alliance. The railway map is the easiest to read at a glance, but has now superimposed it on another showing economic activity and the movement of population. The distribution of industrial activity all over Switzerland, even in the outlying areas, accounts for the strength and stability of the social structure of the country and prevented those horrible 19th century concentrations of industry with their slums a ruthless proletariat. I quote all this, as I said, not to praise Swiss democracy, but to indicate that the federal principle which is at the heart of anarchist social theory is worth much more attention than it is given in the textbooks on political science. Even in the context of ordinary political institutions, its adoption has a far-reaching effect. Another anarchist theory of organization is what we might call the theory of spontaneous order. That given a common need, a collection of people will, by trial and error, by improvisation and experiments, evolve order out of chaos. This order being more durable and more closely related to their needs than any kind of externally imposed order. Kropotkin de derived this theory from the observations of the history of human society and of social biology, was led to his book Mutual Aid. And it has been observed in most revolutionary situations, in the ad hoc organizations which spring up after natural catastrophes, or in any activity where there is no existing organizational form or hierarchical authority. This concept was given the name social control in the book of that title by Edward Ellsworth Ross, who cited instances of frontier societies where, through unorganized or informal measures, order is effectively maintained without benefit of constituted authority. Sympathy, sociability, the sense of justice and resentment are, com are competent under favorable circumstances to work out by themselves a true natural order, that is to say, an order without design or art. An interesting example of the working out of this theory 
was the Pioneer Healthcare Center at Peckham, London, started in the decade before the war by a group of physicians and biologists who wanted to study the nature of health and healthy behavior instead of studying ill health by the rest of their profession. They decided that the way to do this was to start a social club, whose members joined its families and could use a variety of facilities including a swimming bath, theater, nursery, cafeteria, in return for a family membership subscription, and for agreeing to periodic medical examinations. Advice, but not treatment, was given. In order to be able to draw about conclusions, the Peckham biologists thought necessary that they should not be able that they should be able to assert human beings who are free. Free to act as they wished, and to give expression to their desires. So there were no rules and no leaders. I was the only person with authority, said Dr. Scott Williamson, the founder, and I used it to stop anyone from, from exerting any authority. For the first eight months, there was chaos. With the first member families, says one observer, there arrived a horde of undisciplined children who used the whole building as they might have used one vast London street. Screaming and running like hooligans through all the rooms, breaking equipment and furniture. They made it life intolerable for everyone. Scott Williamson, however, insisted that peace should be restored only by the response of the children to the variety of stimuli that was placed in their way. And, in less than a year, the chaos was reduced to an order of, in which groups of children could daily be seen swimming, skating, riding bicycles, using the gymnasium, or playing some game. Occasionally reading a book in the library. The running and screaming were things of the past. More dramatic examples of the same kind of phenomenon are reported by those people who have been brave enough or confident enough to institute self-governing, non-punitive communities of delinquents or maladjusted children. August Eichhorn and Homer Lane are the examples. Eichhorn ran that fabulous institution in Vienna, described in his book Wayward Youth. Homer Lane was a man who, after his parents in America, started in Britain a community of juvenile delinquents boys and girls, call a little commonwealth. Lane used to declare that freedom cannot be given. It is taken by the child in discovery and invention. True to this principle, remarks Howard Jones, he refused to impose upon the children a system of government copied from the institutions of the adult world. The self-governing structure of the little commonwealth was evolved by the children themselves, slowly and painfully to satisfy their own needs. Anarchists believe in leaderless groups. And if this phrase is familiar to you, it is because of the paradox that was known as a leaderless group technique was adopted in the British and American armies during the war, as a means of selecting leaders. The military psychiatrists learn that leader or follower traits are not exhibited in isolation. They are, as one of them wrote, relative to a specific social situation. Leadership vary from situation to situation and from group to group, or as anarchist Mikhail Bakunin put it a hundred years ago, I receive and I give, such is human life. Each direct and is directed in his turn. Therefore, there is no fixed and constant authority, but a continual exchange of mutual, temporary, and above all, voluntary, authority and subordination. This point about leadership was well put in John Comerford's book, Health the Unknown, about the Peckham Experiments. Accustomed as is this age to artificial leadership, it is difficult for it to realize that two of the leaders require no training or appointing, but emerge spontaneously when conditions require them. Studying their members in the free for all of the Peckham Center, the observing scientists saw over and over again how one member instinctively became, and was instinctively but not officially recognized as, leader to meet the needs of one particular moment. Such leaders appeared and disappeared as the flux to the center required. Because they are not consciously appointed, neither, when they have fulfilled their purpose, were they consciously overthrown. Nor was any particular gratitude shown by members to a leader, either at the time of his services or after his services rendered. They followed his guidance just as long as his guidance was helpful and what they wanted. They melted away from him without regrets when some winding new experience beckoned them onto some fresh adventure, which would, in turn, Throw up its spontaneous leader, or when our self confidence was such that any form of constrained leadership would have been a restraint to them. A society, therefore, if left to itself in suitable circumstances to express itself spontaneously, works out its own salvation, 
and achieves a harmony of action which superimposed leadership cannot emulate. Don't be deceived by the sweet reasonableness of all this. This anarchist concept of leadership is quite revolutionary in its implications, as you can see if you look around. For you see everywhere in operation the opposite concept, that of hierarchical, authoritarian, privileged, and permanent leadership. There are very few comparative studies available of the effects of these two opposite approaches to the organization of work. Two of them I will mention later. Another about the organization of architects' offices was produced in 1962 for the Institute of British Architects under the title The Architect and His Office. The team which prepared this report found two different approaches to the design process, which gave rise to different ways of working and methods of organization. One they categorized as centralized, which is characterized by autocratic forms of control, and the other they called dispersed, which promoted what they called an informal atmosphere of free-flowing ideas. This is a very live issue among architects. Mr. W.D. Pyle, who in an official capacity helped to sponsor the outstanding success of post-war British architecture, the school building program, specifies among the things he looks for in a member of the building team that he must have a belief in what I call the non-hierarchical organization of the work. The work has got to be organized not on a star system, but on a repertory system. The team leader may have to be junior to a team member. That will only be accepted if it is commonly accepted that the primacy lies with the best idea and not with the senior man. And one of our greatest architects, Walter Grubius, uh, proclaims that what he calls the technique of collaboration among men which would release the creative instincts on the individual instead of smothering them. The essence of such a technique should be to emphasize individual freedom of initiative instead of authoritarian direction by a boss, synchronizing individual efforts by a continuous give and take of its members. This leads us to another cornerstone of anarchist theory, the idea of workers' control of industry. A great many people think that workers' control is an attractive idea but one which is incapable of realization, and consequently not worth fighting for, because of the scale and complexity of modern industry. How can we convince them otherwise? Apart from pointing out how changing the sources of motive power make the geographical concentration of industry obsolete, and how changing methods of production make the concentration of vast numbers of people unnecessary, perhaps the best method of persuading people that workers control is a feasible proposition in large-scale industry is through pointing to successful examples of what the Guild Socialists called encroaching control. They are partial and limited in effect, as they are bound to be, since they operate within the conventional industrial structure, but they do indicate that workers have an organizational capacity on the shop floor, which most people deny that they possess. Let me illustrate this from two recent instances in modern large-scale industry. The first, the gang system worked in Coventry, was described by an American professor of industrial and magic engineering, Seymour Melman, in his book Decision Making and Productivity. He sought, by a detailed comparison of the manufacture of a similar product, the Ferguson tractor, in Detroit and in Coventry, England, to demonstrate that there are realistic alternatives to managerial rule over production. His account of the operation of the gang system was confirmed by a Coventry engineering worker Reg Wright, in two articles in Anarchy, of Standard's tractor factory in the period up to 1956 when it was sold, Melman writes, In this firm we will show that at the same time, thousands of workers operated virtually without supervision as conventionally understood, and in high productivity. The highest wage in British industry was paid, high quality products were produced at acceptable prices and extensively mechanized plants, the management conducted its affairs at unusually low cost. Also, organized workers had a substantial role in production decision making. From the standpoint of the production workers, the gang system leaves a keeping track of goods instead of keeping track of people. Melman contrasted predatory competition, which characterizes the managerial decision making system, with the workers' decision making system, in which the most characteristic feature of the de decision formulating process is that of the mutuality in decision-making, with final authority 
residing in the hands of the group workers themselves. The gang system, as he described it, is very like the collective contract system advocated by G.D.H. Cole, who claimed that the effect would be to link the members of the working group together in a common enterprise under joint auspices and control, and to emancipate them from an externally imposed discipline in respect of their method of getting the work done. My second example again derives from a comparative study of different methods of work organization made by the Travistock Institute in the late 1950s, reported in E.L. Tris Organizational Choice and P. Erb's Autonomous Group Functioning. Its importance can be seen from the opening words of the first of these. This study concerns a group of miners who came together to evolve a new way of working together, planning the type of change they wanted to put through and testing it in practice. The new type of work organization, which has come to be known in the industry as composite working, has in recent years emerged spontaneously in a number of different pits in the Northwest Durham coal field. Its roots go back to an earlier tradition, which had almost been completely displaced in the course of the last century by the introduction of work techniques based on tax segmentation, differential status of payments, and extrinsic hierarchical control. The other report notes how the study showed the ability of quite large primary work groups of 40 to 50 members to act as self-regulating, self-developing social organisms, able to maintain themselves in a steady state of high productivity. The authors describe the system in a way which shows its relation to anarchist thought. The composite work organization may be described as one in which the group takes over complete responsibility for the total cycle of operations involved in mining the coal face. No member of the group has a fixed work role. Instead, the men deploy themselves, depending on the requirements of the ongoing group task. Within the limits of technological and safety requirements, they are free to evolve their own way of organizing and carrying out their task. They are not subject to any external authority in this respect. Nor is there within the group itself any member who takes over a formal directive leadership function. Whereas in conventional long wall working, the coal gang task is split into four to eight separate work roles, carried out by different teams, each paid at a different rate, in the composite group, members are no longer paid directly for any of the tasks carried out. The all in wage agreement is, instead, based on the negotiated price per ton of coal produced by the team. The income obtained is divided equally among team members. The works I have been quoting were written for specials in productivity and industrial organization, but their lessons are clear for people who are interested in the idea of workers' control. Faced with the objection that even though it can be shown that autonomous groups can organize themselves on a large scale and for complex tasks, it has not been shown that they can successfully coordinate. We resort once again to the federative principle. There is nothing outlandish about the idea that large numbers of autonomous industrial units can federate and coordinate their activities. If you travel across Europe, you go over the lines of a dozen railway systems, capitalist and communist, coordinated by freely arrived at agreements between the various undertaking, with no central authority. We can post a letter to anywhere in the world, but there is no world postal authority. Representatives of different postal authorities simply have a Congress every five years or so. There are trends observable in these occasional experiments in industrial organization, in new approaches to problems of delinquency and addiction, in education and community organization, and in the deinstitutionalization of hospitals, asylums, children's homes, and so on, which have much in common with each other, and which run counter to the generally accepted ideas about organization, authority, and government. Cybernetic theory, with its emphasis on self organizing systems, and speculation about the ultimate social effects of automation leads in a similar revolutionary direction. George and Louise Crowley, for example, in their comments on the reports of the Ad Hoc Committee on a Triple Revolution, Monthly Review, November 1964, remark that, we find it no less reasonable to postulate that a functioning society without authority than a postulated orderly universe without a god. Therefore, the word anarchy is not for us fried with connotations of disorder, chaos, or confusion. For humane men, living in non-competitive conditions of freedom of toil and of universal affluence, 
Anarchy is simply the appropriate state of society. In Britain, Professor Richard Titmus remarks that social ideals may well be as important in the next half century as technical innovation. I believe that the social ideals of anarchism, autonomous groups, plus spontaneous order, workers' control, the federative principle, add up to a coherent theory of social organization, which is a valid and realistic alternative to the authoritarian, hierarchical, and institutional social philosophy, which we see in application all around us. Man will be compelled, Kropotkin declared, to find new forms of organization for the social functions which the state fulfills through bureaucracy. And he insisted that, as long as this is not done, nothing will be done. I think we've discovered what these new forms of organization should be. We have now to make the opportunities for putting them into practice. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.